Thank you so much for coming to this session in the morning. I just woke up, so. <laughs> and uh, it's, a, it's a very special uh, definition for me because um, I forgot which year, I think 2011 or 12 was the very first time I spoke on stage at JotCon, and uh, that was the predecessor of definition, and uh, that kind of inspired me to do this uh, a lot more. So I'm very happy to be back here. And uh, my name is Ray. I'm a developer advocate for the Google Cloud Platform. How many people here heard about Google Cloud Platform before? Using it? Uh, why not? <laughs> well, very good. Um, the, the Cloud Platform has changed quite a bit uh, since the last time you may have tried it. I don't know when. But um, you know, in addition to the infrastructure as a service, we have many, many more managed uh, services as well, especially big data. Uh, my job is to bring some of these latest and greatest technology to developers all over the world and also to get your feedback and understand your use cases. So if you have any questions, just uh, contact me on Twitter, at Satanism. Okay. Aside from uh, technology, um, I've been a developer for many, many years. Um, I'm an ex Red Hatter as well. And uh, aside from technology and uh, working in the industry, I love to travel. I love to take photos, so that's my link to my photos that I take all over the world. Yeah. So how many people here knows about Kubernetes already? Uh, I know they talk about it on the keynote. How many people used it, tried it, seeing action? Yeah, okay, good. So this is gonna be a slightly more intermediate talk on how to use some of the more advanced uh, features that most people don't really know about in Kubernetes, right? So just remember, Kubernetes is a container orchestration tool. Uh, it runs on multiple cloud, uh, on bare metal as well, and it's a vibrant community. And uh, just a quick reminder how, how it actually works. First, you build the container image, right, and you push it to a repository or registry of some sort so that all of the machines that's being managed by Kubernetes can get to. And then you write the way that you want to deploy uh, your application and with all of the facilities that you need. You write a configuration file for that, and then you can push it to the master node via the command line kubectl. And the master node is going to then check against the scheduler and figure out how you are going to deploy this application to which of the nodes that's under the control of Kubernetes, right? So if you have, I like, say, 10 nodes or 1,000 nodes, it uh, doesn't matter. Kubernetes master is going to check to see how much of capacity do you need and uh, how much uh, capacity does each of the node has. And if the node actually has the capacity to run the job, it's going to download the container image and uh, pull that in into the, the node and start running it. And Kubernetes is going to manage all of these kind of processes for you. So it's a really, really nice and easy way. But uh, today we're going to talk a few other things that um, some people don't really know about. Well, first of all, this is going to be a talk on a little bit about auto-scaling. When I started to write this content, when I started to you know, learn about Kubernetes, there was no auto-scaler built in, okay? So I was like, ah, it would be kind of nice if I can do auto-scaling directly with Kubernetes. And, and so I went out and I wrote my own autoscaler. And this is a talk where I want to share my experiences and a lot of the things I learned through that experience. However, I want to point out that since I wrote it, <laughs> um, many months later, they actually have now a real autoscaler as part of Kubernetes 1.2, okay? So that's the one that you kind of really want to use, but I want to use the autoscaling as a demonstration for using some of the more advanced features of Kubernetes. And it's really, really easy to use the autoscaler, uh, really just one command line, kubectl, autoscale, uh, the name of the, your deployment, and, and that's really it, right? So when I started to figure out how to write this autoscaler, just keep in mind, it was the very first time for me to be doing this. I have never written an autoscaler before. You can see that in the fine print. Uh, i never done this before, and this was the very first time to learn about how to write an autoscaler and how to deal with autoscaling problems. So the thing that we're going to autoscale today is actually a in-memory cache. During my time at uh, Red Hat many years ago, I was actually uh, doing a lot of work around uh, in-memory cache and infinite span. How many people here, here uh, have heard about infinite span? Uh, using it? Using it? Yeah, yeah, quite a few. Fantastic. So for the audience who hasn't really seen it, here, I'm just going to go through a very, very quick overview. Right? It's a distributed in-memory cache. Uh, you can also store data in persistent store as well. Uh, it's basically key value, uh, no SQL store. And the key here is that it has a really wonderful elastic property. What do I mean by that? Well, first of all, you can cluster multiple JVMs together um, to form like this pool of cache nodes. And that's all of the capacity that you have. So here we have three different nodes. 
And uh, as you're putting data into this cluster cache, it's going to be able to distribute the data for you across multiple nodes. And it's going to try to do this as evenly as possible uh, via the consistent hashing algorithm, right? And then you can specify how many copies of the same data do you need for redundancy. Why would you want to do that? Well, if one of the nodes fails, you at least have another copy of the same data so that you can recover, and then you can get back to the state where you have redundant data, right? So it's, it's fault tolerant in a way. If you're running out of capacity, what you can do is to just simply spin up another node, and it's going to automatically rebalance the data entries for you across all of the nodes and making sure, again, that you have proper number of redundancy. Um, and that's really it. So it's really nice. So I thought, wouldn't it be really nice if I were able to auto-scale this, right? Because uh, the, the problem I was running into in the past is potentially that you know, I, I don't know how many data entry potentially is going to be coming in, but there could be more. There could be more data than I expected, uh, than what I have provisioned before. And I can probably get the, the metrics, right? I can get the statistics. Um, how many entries do I have currently on this node, or how much memory am I using? And if it's running out of capacity or about to run out of capacity, I want to be able to scale this out. And here is where I got into the auto-scaling part of it, which I have never done before. Just keep you <laughs> posted here. This is my very first time doing this. Actually, how many people here has wrote an auto-scaler before? I just want to see. There's usually one or two people in the audience, no? <laughs> All right, cool. No, that's too bad. I cannot redirect my questions to other people. Um, but this is what I learned. To auto-scale, uh, especially if you're writing like a cloud-native application, if you're running in the cloud where you want to you know, be able to utilize all of the capacities um, and be able to handle these, these spikes, right? you, you kind of need to know about auto-scaling. And here's the easy thing that you can do. right? It's really easy to scale out. You can always add new instances. That's really easy to do, uh, assuming that your application uh, can take advantage of that, whether it's you, by adding more CPU, you can take advantage of the more CPU, or add by adding more memory. Uh, if your application cannot take advantage of that, uh, then, then you're talking about vertical scaling, and uh, it, then it's kind of like uh, it, it's even harder to do. Actually, you don't want to do that. Um, but what is also really easy to do when I look into all of the autoscaler is that it's really easy to autoscale based on the system metrics. And by system metrics, I mean the CPU utilizations and the memory utilization. But if you go anything beyond that, uh, you need additional tooling to help you. And lastly, it's really easy to scale out stateless workload, a workload that has no state. Right, you just add another node, redirect more traffic to it, and everything's just going to work just fine. What is more difficult is, of course, to scale stateful workload. The workload that has data. You cannot just you know, bring up an instance and kill it. If you kill it, if it has data on it, you're going to lose the data. So the difficult part about stateful workload is how are you going to scale in? That's usually more difficult. And when you're scaling in, what most people always forget is that uh, when you scale in too fast, when, when you have another traffic peak that comes over real quickly right after you scale in, the scaling out is going to take some time because it will take time to spin up new instances. So when you're scaling in, you want to do this as lazily as possible. And lastly, it's also harder to deal with custom metrics because most of the tooling don't deal with custom metrics. So uh, this talk, this today, I'm just going to be doing the difficult stuff. Uh, just how do we actually auto-scale in FitnessBand, which is stateful, with custom metrics, which is the number of entries per node. That's the, the metrics I'm going to pick and use. I'm going to do this both scaling out and be able to scale in, depending on the traffic patterns of um, you know, how much data I'm putting into here. Right? This is only for demonstration purposes, and um, I hope you can you know, try this out and uh, learn a few things as well. So this is the pattern that I see in many of the autoscalers. It doesn't matter which you know, cloud provider that you go to um, or which autoscaler um, product that you see. This is kind of the high-level pattern architecture that I have kind of gathered together. Right? First, you have the actual instance, whether it's a node or an application. It doesn't matter. It's just like something that's running your application. There's your app. And usually, the metrics is being collected by like, a separate process, like a metrics collector. Why? Because usually, there's a metrics server that's running somewhere else that's just waiting for the metrics to come in. And for example, there are something like InfluxDB, where you can push metrics to, and then you can query it later. Um, so your app will be pushing the metrics to the metrics server. It's going to be stored somewhere in the metrics store. 
And then your autoscaler, the autoscaler component, is going to be responsible to be pulling from the metric server periodically. I don't know how often, say every 10 seconds or every minute, uh, to see what is the average utilization of your cluster in the past, again, another duration. And based on that, based on that utilization, it's going to make the, the decision on whether you need more nodes or if you need less nodes, right? So it's going to determine the desired number of nodes. Like if you have overutilized, it's going to say I need more. If it's underutilized, it's going to say I need less. However, once it makes that decision, somebody actually has to make this a reality, right? Just saying that I need five doesn't make any difference if nobody's doing it. So there's another thing that's called an actuator that's actually capable of taking the number of instances you want and making that a reality, right? The actuator is supposed to say, okay, you need five, I already have three, so I can just spin up two more. Or you have five and you need two, it's going to kill three, right? The actuator is responsible to doing that. But when the actuator wants to create this new instance, it needs to know how, and the way it's going to do that usually is like a template. It's a template on how you can actually instantiate a new instance of your application. So what I have done is that um, I thought, wait a second, with Kubernetes, it's actually quite easy. Because Kubernetes, I can really, really easily to tell it how many instances of something I want. Right? I can scale this out and in as many as I want and uh, as, as often as I want. So in effect, Kubernetes is like an actuator in this case. I'm going to use it as an actuator. And the image template is really just a pod template. It's the, the YAML files that you create that can spin up new instances of your pod or application. That's the template. And when I say Kubernetes, go ahead and scale this uh, template to or pod to like three copies, it's going to go ahead and instantiate it for me. What I have to do myself is to create like a metric server to store the metrics and also the autoscaler that kind of makes the call to the actuator and determines how many uh, number of instances do I need, okay? So again, <laughs> keep in mind, this, I've never done this before. It's my very first time doing it. So what is really cool, I'm gonna jump into the demo a little bit. Uh, so right here, I have this awesome visualizer, which I used <laughs> a long time ago as well, but it's, it's really a good visualizer. This is actually on GitHub as well. This is open source. Um, and uh, I'm going to show you a few things. So right now, I have one node, one pod, actually, I should say pod, of infinite span node running, okay? And this is running inside of Kubernetes. If I want to scale this out, all I have to do is to say kubectl scale rc, for example, infinite span controller, that's the name of the replication controller that controls the number of instances that I want. If I need to scale out, all I have to do is say, let me say I need two replicas. And behind the scenes, Kubernetes is going to try to start another instance of my infinite span container, right? Because I already, I already created the container image, it's already in the registry. Once they scale out, it's going to go ahead and figure out which machine has the capacity and then pull down the image for me and start it. And this is going to take a little time as it's going to go through the initialization. But uh, once it's done, you can see two nodes here. If I need to scale in, all I need to do is to issue that command line and uh, say, rather than two, I want one, okay? So let me put some data in here um, to see uh, how this works, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and I have this little Java application, it's a little demo app, it's just a jar file. What I can do is I can say, okay, I need 100 entries, I wanna generate and put it into my, my cluster, right? This can be anything, it's key value pairs. Um, and then I need to give it a starting node. Like how do I, where is the server, right? Where, where the hell is the server? Which node can I connect to? Now here's the interesting part. Kubernetes has a built-in concept of a service. A service is usually a stable IP address that can low balance the traffic for you, okay? You can think about it like a low balancer. Now, with infinite span, it gets a little tricky. Why? Because infinite span uses consistent hashing. When you know the key, infinite span actually knows exactly which of these two nodes to connect to. What that also means is when you want to connect to infinite span, you don't really want to have a load balancer that load balances it for you, right? Why? Because if the load balancer load balances you to a node that doesn't have the data, it's going to have another network hop to get to the data. So you don't want that. So the regular load balancer uh, that is by default used in Kubernetes doesn't really work. 
But that is okay because you can actually specify different types of service or different type of load balancer in Kubernetes. And one of the lesser known type is called a headless service. A headless service in Kubernetes just means that it's a service that's created. I can actually see it. I can do a kubectl get SVC. I can actually see the service if I have internet. Uh, this will actually show up. <laughs> Where's my internet? I think I lost it. Yes, I did lose my internet. It's gone. <laughs> so I need uh, to get back online. Give me one second. Uh -huh. I need to get back to the, uh, let me open up a hotspot just in case. Yeah, I lost my internet. So uh, a little story about this as well. I don't know if anyone went to or have seen DevOps. DevOps, anyone heard about DevOps? It's one of the largest uh, conference in the world. Uh, DevOps Belgium is by far the largest one. And um, it was my moment. I walk in the room, I, I check all the, uh, the Wi-Fi to be working and everything, and then 400, 500 people came in. <laughs> and then, as I was about to do my demo, the Wi-Fi disappeared. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> so, unfortunately, this happened again today. And I don't see anyone watching YouTube videos here, so I think it's not your fault. <laughs> Personal hotspot, there we go. I'm gonna turn this on. Turn it on. And uh, if you ever played with containers, you know doing a live demo with containers over a, a hotspot connection is uh, usually fairly difficult. <laughs> but that is OK. So let me see if I can get back on here. Uh, did I, do I still don't have connection? No, I don't. There we go. It's going to be a very expensive bill for me, but we'll see. <laughs> Um, this also happened to me in France a couple weeks ago, and uh, uh, Emmanuel Bernard, actually one of the developers of Hibernate OGM, he, uh, he let me borrow his uh, Tether hotspot as well. Okay, let me get, oh, there we go, I'm back. All right, so here we go. Woo, thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank, thank, thank goodness for the phone. <laughs> uh, okay, um, so, so here we go. So we have the service here, and I have a service called Infinite Span, but let's take a look at this. Everybody else has this cluster IP, that is a stable IP address that load balances for you. When you create a headless service, it doesn't create a stable IP address for you. What it actually does is that you will actually create a DNS entry for you. Ah. And this DNS entry, if you try to ping it, let me get back to my shell that's inside of the cluster. There we go. If I try to ping InfiniSpan, this is going to resolve into an IP. But, uh, but this is actually a run robin um, DNS name. It has multiple A records. If I do a get int host, and if I want to see what is the, the record associated with this DNS name, you can see there too, which is fantastic. So what that means is that in some of the workload where you need to get to a starter node, uh, you don't need to use a load balancer. Uh, you can just use one of these things, and it's going to resolve to one of the IP addresses that's actually alive and healthy. And with the infinite span, once it gets to one node, it's going to be able to learn the topology of all of the other nodes. So this is the perfect use case for it. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, use this, uh, this uh, technique, basically, to uh, ask my client here to generate 100 entries. And I'm going to put it into infinite span cluster. And this is going to resolve to a single IP address. And then it's going to get the rest of the topology, right? And so once I do this, here we go. Oh, I need to, I think, refresh this as well. And I need to go to the cache. I am putting stuff in. There we go. So we have 100 entries in here. And of course, if I were to say, if I need three replicas, how many entries each do you think this will have? Three replicas. Um, so we have a total of 100 entries, two, you know, two copies of each. So it's a total of 200 entries. If I bring up another node, uh, it's basically 200 divided by 3, so I'm looking at about 66 entries per node, right? That's, that's really what it would be. So all I need to do is to say scale, and I'm just going to wait for it. <laughs> now, you will be asking, hold on a second. I, I'm doing all of these things via the command line, but, but you're writing an autoscaler. Uh, if, I need, if I want to do this programmatically, how do I do that? Well, the good news is everything that you're doing via the command line is actually translated into an API call. Kubernetes was created with API-first uh, thinking. So what that means is 
I can actually go. Let me see if this is up and running. No, it's not. Uh, let me get this proxy. There we go. So I can actually go to my. Ooh, there we go. V1. I can actually go to my uh, API endpoint for my Kubernetes master. I can actually see all of the things that I can read and control. And one of these is going to be, um, for example, replication controllers. And I can go in there. I can get my JSON payload, which is fantastic. Uh, I can also format this to other format as well if I want to. Um, and here I have, all, I have all of the replication controllers I created. Uh, the one I'm interested in was the infinite span controller, which is this one. Okay? And I can also get to its self link, and this is the thing I can control. Now, in Kubernetes, everything has a label. So even though here we have like 20 entries of uh, different controllers here, what I can also do is I can do a label query or a label selector, and I can say name is equal to infinite span, I think. And by doing this, I can actually query the label via the API. And rather than getting 100 entries or whatever, like 20 entries I have, uh, now I just have one item. That is exactly what I needed. Okay. Now, if I need to get to this um, specific controller directly, I can follow the self-link. So I can go here. You can see the, uh, the URL is very, very easily constructed. Once you know the namespace, the name of the controller, you can just construct, uh, construct this URL. So I can go here. And this is the detail of my controller in my state at this moment. Okay, so you can see that it is running three copies. So I can see replicas is equal to three. And I can see that this is the, the type of things I'm running. All right, so what I can do then is I can actually take this. Now, this is the cool part. I can, I can take it and um, I can use the, the RESTful API to control my Kubernetes cluster. And this is a really, really powerful thing. Everything that you were doing with the command line, with the deployments, and with the scaling, you can do that with the, the RESTful API as well. I'll just show you how that can be done. So I can go ahead and curl this URL. Uh, I can go ahead and dump it into a, a JSON file, for example, rc.json. I can open it up, right? And I can modify the replicas here. I can say, OK, you know what? I don't want three. I need the four. So I can just modify that. And then I can do a post. Uh, in this case, I'm going to do a put. Now, if you want to uh, just patch the difference, you can do a patch, right, if you want to do a partial update. So let me see. I don't know if I have this queued up. I do. Woo so I can do a curl with the put method with the JSON payload. That's of the content type application JSON. Uh, and then I can post it back to this URL, which I got it back from. OK? And so as soon as I do this, if I go back to my, uh, my console here, I can see I'm spinning up one more instance. So this is a really, really easy way for you to use the API. And just about every resource you're creating and managing in Kubernetes, you can access it via the API as well. However, if you are trying to do this via, like, from within the cluster, what I have done is I created the proxy, a secure proxy, to get access to my cluster. So I can do all of these things via just a simple HTTPS request. If your application needs to get access to this, then you're going to run into some issues. <laughs> so I'll show you what that means. Uh, oh, term is, I'm going to use, what's, what's your favorite terminal? X term. All right, here we go. All right, good. Uh, what I can do is I can go to, uh, if I want to do a curl, uh, HTTPS, and by default, you create the, the API server as, uh, with the domain name Kubernetes uh, host name. Um, and I can do API v1 replication controllers, right? So I'm going to you know, try to make this API request, and it's going to tell me the first issue. The first issue that is the HTTPS uh, endpoint that actually has a certificate you need to use. And the good news is that from within the application that's running inside of Kubernetes within the pod, they actually give you the certificate to use. So it's usually located under var run secrets. Uh, basically, it's almost like a service account. Okay. And underneath here is going to give you a few files. And one of those files is the CA cert. Now, if you're running this in a Java application, you know how sucky that would be to use your own, <laughs> basically, custom uh, certification uh, for SSL. But uh, don't worry about it. It's, it's actually not that hard. Um, I have some example code. And if you use some client library, it's going to be taken care of for you anyways. OK, so I can do, go ahead and do a curl, CA cert, um, CA.cert. 
And then I can do the HTTPS, Kubernetes, uh, API v1, replication, controller. OK. Oh, so now, now the certification problem went away. The CA cert went away. Uh, but now I'm being told that this is an unauthorized request. So that sucks. So, so because the API uh, endpoint is secured, um, you can basically customize how you want to secure it. Uh, but in this installation, I'm using tokens. And this application happens to have access to the token. So the token is given to you, also mounted in this temporary file system and under the same directory, and just called token. So I can go ahead and cat it. This is the token you need to do, you need to use in the header. And what you can do is to basically add this to the header. And the header is a pretty standard, oh, oh, um, let me see here. The header is pretty standard. I cannot go back. OK, so let me do this. CA cert. I have to retype everything. CA cert. CA dot cert. Uh, I need the header, so it's dash H. Authorization. That's an authorization header. It's a bearer token, token, so I need to do that. And then I can just input the, the, the token. I'm going to copy and paste the token here. Um, and then I can go ahead and fetch the URL. So I can do something like that. Kubernetes, API v1, replication controllers. OK. So I, I know you couldn't see the whole command line because my terminal is getting all messed up. But basically, the gist here is that for you to connect to the API, you're going to have the right certificate, and you need to have the right authorization by using the token. Or sometimes it could be something else. OK. And once you have access to this API, then you can do whatever you want uh, with the Kubernetes cluster. You can deploy new instances. You can scale them in and scale them out. Um, so that's exactly how I have written uh, my autoscaler. Uh, and there's actually quite a nice library, a client library you can use. It's actually written by Fabric8. Uh, so if you search for Fabric8 Kubernetes API client, you should be able to find it. Uh, there we go. Uh, it's a really, really nice uh, Kubernetes client for Java developers. Uh, I really like using it as well. <coughs> So that's number one. Um, <clears throat> there's some code sample here. I'm not going to go into detail. Uh, behind the scenes, I'm using uh, Spring Boot in this case. Um, and uh, let me see here. What I want to talk about is how you collect metrics. Okay? So I'm exporting my metrics via GMX. That's what Infinite Span gives you. You can get to know how many entries you have in, the, in, in your cluster by checking the GMX entries. Uh, but my metrics server doesn't understand GMX. I, I need a JSON payload. I need, to, I need this application to post something to my, uh, my JSON payload uh, to my uh, metrics server. So what I've used is GMX trans. I don't know if anyone uses it here. Anyone seen it? No? So basically, it, uh, it's another it's an open source project. You can configure it to connect to a GMX uh, server, uh, whichever. And then um, you can use some kind of connector. I wrote my own connector. So it's going to constantly pull the number of entries and then push it into my autoscaler, into my metric server. That's exactly what it's doing. Now, the interesting part here is that uh, this collector runs in a separate process. In, in Kubernetes, there's this concept of a pod, right? And this usually is one of the harder to understand concepts, even though this is the most fundamental concept you need to know. A pod is a collection of containers that is tightly coupled and that lives and die together. In many cases, uh, people are having a hard time coming up with good use case of a pod. Uh, basically, you may have your main application container, and then you can run some kind of what we call a sidecar container. In this case, the metrics collector itself is a sidecar container. It runs on the side of my main application, so that my main application doesn't have to think about what What's, what metrics do I need to export, right? My main application just needs to deal with GMX. And I can have another sidecar container that runs within the same pod aside to my main application that will know how to deal with the, the metrics. That's exactly what this is doing, OK? So I'm going to go ahead and spin up my, uh, my autoscaler as well. So I'm going to do kubectl scale. No, oh, sorry, let me see what's here. So I'm going to go uh, kubectl scale uh, rc. I'm going to spin up my autoscaler uh, to one instance now. Okay. And in autoscaling, uh, this is not going to do anything just yet because I haven't configured it. Uh, in autoscaling, usually you will need to know a few things. And it's very similarly configured uh, in most of the autoscaler. Is that, well, what is it that you want to use as the metrics? 
right? What is it that you want to use as a metric for utilization? It could be CPU, it could be a memory, it could be uh, the custom metrics that you have, whether it's request per second count, or um, in this case, just the number of entries. And then you need to give it some kind of threshold. This is the threshold that you, uh, you want to have per node, right? If you exceed the thre threshold per node on average, then you need, to, then you need more instances. Uh, you also need to know um, how often you want to check for the average utilization. Now, here's the tricky part. If you check it too fast, then there are cases where the system is being too noisy, and you're going to respond to the noise, and it's going to generate even more noise. Right? Does that make sense? Because when it's spinning up application, it's going to generate a lot of CPU usages, and it's going to cause noise in your system. If you scale too slowly, then uh, you may not be able to respond to a sudden peak. Uh, in traffic, right? So you really have to tune this and just kind of understand your pattern a little bit more. Now, here's the two other interesting part that you are going to see usually in an auto scaling situation. You're going to be able to specify the minimum copy of something that you need to run. For infinite span, for redundancy, I need to have at least two nodes running for high availability. So I'm going to say at least I need two. Even if it's being underutilized, I need two. And maximum, utilize, maximum number of instances uh, so that you don't you know, you don't spin up like 100 instances of something when you're not supposed to, then you can usually set a max, okay? Then this is what you're going to see in the Kubernetes autoscaler, the one that you may actually be using as well, okay? So I'm going to go ahead and send this uh, configuration to my autoscaler uh, no, uh, server, okay? So that's done. So now what is this doing is that it's checking my average utilization right now. Okay, it's going to do this every 10 seconds or so. And I, hopefully, what this is going to see is that uh, my cluster is being underutilized because I'm saying that I only want 100 entries per node. It's going to say, nah, you know what? You got four nodes. You can handle this with two. And immediately, it's going to use Kubernetes and terminate uh, a few nodes for me, okay? which is pretty cool. So this is going to do this for me automatically. There you go. Now, here's the tricky part. <laughs> Here's the tricky part. Um, because I only have two copies of something in Infinite Span, um, if I terminate two nodes at the same time, <laughs> there's a real chance I'm going to lose data. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Scaling in is going to be difficult. But with auto scaling, you have to really be conscious, be you know, understanding your data to understand what is the maximum number you can tolerate. Um, so I, what I have configured here in my auto scaler, in my own, is to say, you know what? I only want to scale in one at a time. I don't care if I'm overutilizing, you know, by ten instances, but I don't want to kill all nine of them at the same time because I could be losing data. So I'm gonna just ramp down slowly. Okay? So let's give this a try. So, <laughs> so, so this is what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to go back to my application. I'm going to uh, Java jar my application. Uh, I'm going to go up to maybe 400 entries. And uh, here's my server. OK, infinite span. OK, here we go. So with 400 entries, how many nodes are we expecting? Any guesses? Anything? 400 entries, how many nodes? I'm sorry? Four. Four? Ah, but we have two copies of everything. So that literally means 800 entries that will be spread across, and it will be eight. That's correct. So I'm going to do this. Uh, by the way, slow down the insertion process. Uh, Infinite Span is much, much faster than this, just so you know. I slow it down so you can see the visual effects. That's really it. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll be done like that, and then I'll have nothing to show. There we go. So, <laughs> OK, so scaling out is fine. Uh, I can spin up as many instances I want when I'm scaling out. So actually, if I go here and see, yeah, I'm actually scaling out. I'm going to, the moment I'm going to see it, the way it's going to calculate is based on the average. Uh, actually, let me show you the, the, uh, the algorithm. Hold on, give me one second. Here we go. Here's the algorithm. So basically, what it's doing is to take the sum of the utilization, the total number of entries, uh, divide by the target utilization, which is 100, and that you take the ceiling of that, and that determines the actual number of nodes that you need. You need a ceiling because if you don't use the ceiling, you're going to be, un you're going to be short by one node, potentially. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in this particular case, yes. Uh, however, here's another thing. Uh, do I have it here? Um, no, I don't have it in the slide, but I do have this built-in, and this is also, when you think about auto-scaling, this is what auto-scalers do. 
there's usually a buffer. There's usually a buffer that says, you know what, I don't mind if just one more came in. It's going to say, I'm able to tolerate 20% difference so that it doesn't always go overboard、uh, just by a tiny difference in terms of utilization. Yeah, and the same thing is applied when you're scaling down. You'll be like,、uh, is 20%, 20 less?、Uh, that's okay. You know, you know what I mean? Like, you do want to have a buffer in there. It's not a hard set rule in this case. Yeah? Okay, so there you go. So I got all of a sudden it's been up、um, 100 instances,、uh, sorry, eight instances for me. And you can see the average utilization here. Now, what I'm going to do is go ahead and、uh, try to delete some of these things. So, what I'm going to do is、uh, I'm going to take this back down to maybe、uh, 100 instances, 100, 100 entries. So, I'm going to subtract 100, and、uh, this is going to be an operation of remove. Okay? And so, this is going to do this slowly. It's going to remove、uh, 300 objects from my cluster.、Uh, there we go. Now it's removing. So, it's going to delete entries. So, now my, cl my cluster is being, going to be underutilized. Now, remember, I'm only going to delete one instance at a time by using Kubernetes, right? So, it's going to take away one instance at a time. Every time I take away an instance, it's going to auto rebalance. It's going to make sure I have two copies of everything, right? If I take away instance, I lost a few copies, and it's going to try to re redistribute this for me. So, if this all works out really well, <laughs> I should end up with two nodes. With 100 entries in each. And that would mean I didn't lose any data. <laughs>、uh, I don't know if that's going to happen. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah.、Um, so for that, I, oh yeah. So to see the rebalancing, I don't know if you can see the rebalancing, but you can see the state transfer states, right? You should be able to see whether the state transfer has finished. So, so for me, actually,、uh, I'm using what do you call it?、Um, in Kubernetes, there's this thing called the, the readiness check and、uh, the health checks, right? So you can check whether the node is ready to serve. And this is actually a pretty interesting、uh, topic for InfiniSpan because、uh, the node is only ready to accept new data when potentially it's completed the state transfer, for example, or it's preloaded data from the persistent store. That's in cache now, now it's ready to serve. So you can actually produce、uh, and make your own checks to see if that kind of thing is happening. And then you can say, OK, it is ready to serve. I'm ready to use this node and, and then bring this into the cluster. Right? Yeah, question. Yeah. Yeah, so when you're scaling down,、uh, it actually does a graceful shutdown. Yeah, yeah. You could、uh, to have those checks if that's available. Yeah.、Uh, I'm not doing it here, but the, my graceful shutdown is just waiting for i n f i n i s p a n to do whatever cleanup it needs to.、Yeah. And then there's a hard timeout. It, you can say, you know what? If it's taking five minutes, I don't want to wait for it. I just need to kill it. You can set a hard timeout if you need to just kill an instance. Otherwise, it's going to try, try to clean up until the hard timeout has reached. And very luckily today,、uh, <laughs> I scaled down to two nodes and I still have 100 entries, so it's been a good day today. <laughs> Now, here's the interesting part.、Uh, just one last note、uh, from my slides here. Let's see here. Remember, scaling in is harder、uh, because you have to remember it's expensive to scale out. Even in Kubernetes, right, we can spin up your pod really, really quickly. However,、uh, we have to wait for your applications to start. <laughs> And your application could take a long time. I don't know. It could take seconds or minutes. I, I don't know. But、uh, scaling out could be、uh, harder and more expensive. Now, here's the part that you have to really remember. When the instance goes away, their metrics don't matter anymore. If it is still being used to calculate your average utilization, then you are off. <laughs> What that means is when the instance goes away, I need to get rid of it in my store. And how do I do that?、Um, do I do this periodically by doing like a, a, a check every few seconds? Or it's actually better if I get notified for it, right? So I can actually get notifications. This is the one last thing I want to show you.、Um, remember, we use curl to get the pods. This is like one request, right? If I need to receive a notification, if I need a string of the event that's happening, I can go through this API endpoint. I can just say a question mark, watch is equal to true. And then this becomes a string. And anytime anything happens in this cluster, in this case for the pods, 
I can get a notification for it. So for example, I'm going to uh, pull this out, okay, and uh, pull this up here. Uh, let me just go ahead and uh, do a kubectl scale. Uh, actually, you know what? Let me do the auto scaler here. So I'm going to put, it, put back a few entries. And it's going to try to spin up new, new parts for me. And just watch this string very carefully. As it is going to spin up new things, how much time do I have? There we go. You see that? I just got a notification here with an event. Uh, something's got modified. Um, and I think I should also see something that's got uh, inserted, for example, that's added. You basically can listen to the stream of events of what's happening within your cluster. And this is what I'm using in my autoscaler as well. As, the, as one of these pods gets removed, I listen to the event and I get rid of their metrics because their average utilization doesn't matter anymore. Okay? So yeah, it's really nice um, to understand the Kubernetes API and be able to use it in your own way. I know people have built their own dashboard. In fact, if you use the Kube dashboard, which is like a UI, um, it's all using the API behind the scenes. The API is really accessible. I have a visualization tool that I use that uses API behind the scenes. Um, and there are people who build their own dashboard to control their cluster as well. Okay. Um, yeah, so try Kubernetes today. And um, I don't know if there are any questions. Any questions? I don't know how much time do I have. What time is it right now, anyways? 12.15? 4.2? 4.2? I got 15 minutes, okay. Very cool, yeah. Any questions? We got like 15 minutes or five, doesn't matter. <laughs> um, um, not, I, I'm not, not quite sure about OpenShift, to be honest. I think they have other facilities as built in. Um, what I have heard is potentially that, uh, you, I mean, you can use all the basic Kubernetes construct there. So you can choose to do that, or if there are better constructs in uh, OpenShift that better suits this, um, you know, you can use that instead. But I, I do not know OpenShift as much, so yeah. Yeah. Right. Ah, uh, I see, I see. Um, yeah, I'm not sure, actually, yeah. But, uh, but if you need to use transaction in this case, yeah, that may be a problem. But unless if an expense man understands the graceful shutdown, right, and understands, you know, I need to finish this before I, um, I terminate, then that should be okay. But only if that's the case, yeah. The thing here is that uh, in this type of system, uh, especially when you're managing containers, uh, things can come and go, right? You're really building a fault-tolerant system uh, most of the time, uh, hopefully, hopefully. And um, things could come and go, and you gotta deal with it somehow. Uh, now, in Kubernetes 1.3, I don't know how, many, how much you have heard about Kubernetes 1.3, uh, there's another thing that's new in 1.3 that deals quite nicely with persistent, uh, like, stateful applications. So if you're thinking about, say, infinite span, in this case, which I'm storing everything in memory, if I'm using a backend store, if I'm persisting also per node the data into a persistent store, like uh, on the disk, right? So every one of these, hold on, if I go back here, every one of these uh, pods is going to get its own persistent store behind the scenes. If I'm scaling this in and out, uh, the, the problem that you're going to run into is, well, where do I store that data? How is Kubernetes going to manage that disk for me? Uh, before 1.3, it's a very difficult thing to do. Um, but in 1.3, we have a construct called a pet set, okay? And in a pet set, every one of these pods will be named. And the name will be um, uh, predictable, right? It will be a name that will be like infinite span dash zero. In, in, and then if you have a second node, it will be infinite span dash one, and then infinite span dash two, and blah, blah, blah. And each one of those pods will have a persistent disk you can configure a persistent disk that can be auto provisioned for you so that infinite span dash one will have a volume that's also called infinite span dash one. And if that pod goes away, uh, and if it comes back, it's going to be able to use the same disk. Okay? If you scale this out, it's going to say, okay, you have two nodes, now I need to go to infinite span three. It's going to 
spin up your application, but also provision automatically the volume that can be used for this particular instance. And that's really nice. Uh, yesterday, there was a demo where um, one, of the pres one of the presenters, he presented 1,000 node, 8,000 core <laughs> Kubernetes cluster running Google Cloud Platform, and he's running like 500 Cassandra nodes in there. Yeah? Or it's, uh, like 1,000 Cassandra nodes in there. Uh, and he's using the pet set to deal with the persistent data that way, which is really cool. Uh, if you are run running Zookeeper, you can use that with Zookeeper as well. Any other questions? No? Um, one thing I do want to point out, just one last thing. When InfiniSpan is trying to figure out who, to, you know, who is in the cluster, um, usually this is being done by multicast. OK? Who uses multicast here? <laughs> A few people. Yeah, most people cannot use it. Um, in Kubernetes, uh, you probably don't want to use that either. Um, so what multicast is going to do, or during the discovery phase when the, one of these nodes starts, is trying to broadcast itself out to the cluster and figure out who else is there. Uh, since you cannot use the multicast, uh, the alternative is to connect to like a starting node. Uh, but since this, everything here is elastic, we don't know which one's the starting node. Uh, it's actually using the API. It's actually using the API to figure out what is actually running right now. And it's going to pick one of those things and join the cluster. And that's, the API is really, really powerful that way. So the takeaway here is really just understand the API. Understand uh, you can actually filter things by label if you want to by, when you're using the API. When you connect to the API, you have to use tokens and certificates. And the, the most powerful feature in my mind is really these events you can watch. Right? These are streaming events that you can watch. So keep in mind, this is the first time I have written this. So. <laughs> um, Definitely don't use my autoscaler. <laughs> it's open source. But if you want to do autoscaling, uh, it's really easy to do. Just do um, kubectl autoscale. And if you see the help, uh, you'll see uh, the example coming in line here. You can autoscale the, com uh, the deployment. You can give it the mean and the max and the CPU percentage uh, threshold. Exactly the same concepts I kind of talked about previously. All right. So thank you very much. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for coming.